Thank you. So we can start. Um, so we're uh, very happy to have you. We're accompanied by an exceptional panel of speakers today, uh, which I will introduce uh, in a few minutes. Um, <clears throat> in his opening remarks, the UN Secretary General today spoke about the power of civil society organizations and those on the ground to really impact change. Um, of course, the process of social transformation is a very complex process that uh, includes the interplay and collaboration of different actors and entities in society, such as individuals, institutions, and communities. Um, when we talk about social transformation, often we focus really on the role of institutions, global leaders, and those who hold decision-making power, um, which is of course crucial if any change is to take place. But an essential element uh, in this process of change, which is sometimes maybe underestimated, is the power of individuals and communities to really be impacting uh, that change. Um, and social movements and these social calls for change are actually um, often the, the um, elements that serve as, as engines of social transformation. And the impact of these actions can be seen throughout history and both, of course, in, in, in modern times uh, in support of, for example, the empowerment and advancement of women's rights, uh, or the abolish, uh, abolishment of slavery and, and other issues that I think many people here are uh, familiar with. And these collective calls for redefining narratives and values have really made profound changes uh, in society throughout history, impacting not only the narratives and creating new narratives, but also institutional behaviors and decision-making in lasting ways. Also actions by individuals and communities have uh, uh, the capacity to, to not only change the course of history, but also reflect and mirror society's realities, and needs, and challenges, because they often arise as direct responses to societal conditions. Um, and of course, digital age uh, and the advent of the internet and social media have transformed and amplified the power of social movements and the actions of individuals tremendously, allowing for causes to mobilize internationally and gain global uh, visibility and put pressure on governments and institutions in unprecedented ways. The digital age has also allowed global leaders to be in direct conversation with citizens uh, in ways that was not before possible. Um, of course, the impact of social uh, movement and social change has many different dimensions, but three important ways that I just wanted to highlight here that we can see is one change at the level of culture, a shift in prevalent narratives and policy and legislative change. So social movements by their nature um, mean essentially deep fundamental change at the level of grassroots and have a profound capacity to transform society, redefine narratives, shape collective thought, values and societal norms and create deep rooted change, changes at the level of culture. They call for alternative visions of society, engaging people and their institutions in the process of consultation and conversation about the future of their societies, leading to shifts in the way societies understand and engage with various issues. And by highlighting inequalities, injustices, or unsustainable practices, they call on societies to reconsider and often redefine what is considered acceptable and desirable. They call for a vision of society that is to be formed and written collectively by the participation of all members of society. They aspire towards a society built on the foundations of unity, interconnectedness, and equality with laws and policies that reflect these same principles for all people. They also create new language, ideas, and messages, allow societies uh, to articulate their vision and aspirations uh, in ever more clear ways coherent with their reality. They also uh, sh create shifts in narratives and public opinion about issues as, uh, or certain populations in society. They're able to challenge existing narratives. And this is really especially true in societies where certain groups have faced, for example, institutional discrimination and hate propaganda, which has impacted the country's perception and behavior uh, towards them. And lastly, one of the most tangible ways that social movements create change is through influencing legislative and policy reforms by drawing attention to issues, rallying public support, and applying pressure on policymakers. 
uh, these movements can lead to the enactment of laws and policies that reflect their goals. So before moving on to our wonderful uh, panelists, I wanted to share one example of a collective action by the BIC, which led to significant change in public opinion. As you know, um, the Baha'i Baha'is in Iran and the Baha'i community in Iran has faced persecution in the country for uh, over 45 years. This past June marked the 40th anniversary of the execution of 10 Baha'i women uh, in Iran in the city of Shiraz, most of them between the ages of 16 to 25. <clears throat> and they were really all ordinary girls and women whose only crime was their belief in the Baha'i faith. And they were all executed on one night in the middle of the night by hanging. They were executed for their belief in the principles of oneness, equality, justice, and the freedom to believe. 40 years later, to honor the anniversary of their execution, the BIC organized a campaign called Our Story is One, honoring not only them, but all women and the long struggle for equality lived by women of all faiths and all backgrounds in Iran and around the world. And uh, the persecution and the struggle that really continues to this day. The campaign aimed to demonstrate that despite years of systematic hate speech and acts of discrimination towards groups of different faiths and backgrounds, that our story is a shared one. We have become unified in our resilience, in our unwavering strength to combat oppression, and above all, to rebuild a better world, whatever sacrifices it takes. The campaign had unprecedented support globally, reaching the hearts and minds of millions around the world. In a remarkable display of solidarity with the Baha'i community, the campaign received support from many prominent individuals and groups from around the world, including government officials, high-level dignitaries such as foreign ministers, Nobel Peace laureates, artists, musicians, and countless others. The campaign not only responded to the systematic and government-sponsored hate speech inside Iran against the Baha'is, but group global support and resonated with women around the world. We had art contributions, songs, public statements, and many other forms of support from really every corner of the world, showing truly society's capacity for global unity and the importance of a united response to challenges. So before continuing and handing it over to the speakers, I want to share a short video of the campaign and the support it received. refusing to renounce their faith. NBC's Yasmin Vesugian explains how activists are now calling for change. Called the hashtag, our story is one. of our organization, of our international alliance, working together will be stronger on your behalf than the voice of any individual country alone. When you let me be free to say who I am and what I want, why don't you give me freedom of speech? That was Mona's words 40 years ago, just as probably today, as, as, as it was then. Lovely words live on. She may not be here, but her, lives, her words live on.
Look at the pictures of these women who made a decision that they would stand up and say no because we deserve the right to embrace our religion and its values. I do believe that this defiant stand against the oppressor is what unites and makes our story one. Could you please repeat what are the four points that they were all in agreement with? Uh, oneness was the first uh -huh. one. Uh, you mean that they were executed for? Yeah. Uh, yeah oneness, justice, equality, and freedom to vote. Thank you. Um, so I'm. We're really lucky and grateful to have uh, four uh, really uh, exceptional panelists with us. Um, I will start with our first speaker, Honorable uh, Gatani Wamachoka, a representative from the government of Kenya. Uh, Ms. Wamachumba is a two-term Kenyan member of parliament, known for her leadership roles and significant contributions in various parliamentary committees and caucuses. She's a celeb she's celebrated for her community service, especially in combating domestic violence, substance abuse, which garnered her national and international recognition. As the first female MP for Gitunguri constituency, she notably received the highest number of votes for an MP in 2017. She's recognized for her multifaceted career as an environmental auditor, PR practitioner, media owner, and commercial farmer. She's deeply committed to family life, earning the affectionate nickname of Mate or mother from her constituents. We are extremely honored to have her on this panel with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I am so humbled and uh, honored to be in this forum tonight. I can't say much when I watch such a moving video of women who were before us who have set for us the pace. I come from a community where patriarchism, culture and religion is one of the biggest limiting barrier towards women development. Our story is one because a woman in Baha'i community and a woman in the Kenyan community go through the same uh, problems and challenges. It doesn't really matter what language or what color or what religion that woman is engraved with. What matters is a space available for that woman to enjoy her space. I happen to come from a community where women are not supposed to be in the political leadership. And those that have been there have been tormented and have gone through a lot of economic and political torture. But some of us believe that sisterhood is powerful. And the spirit of sisterhood have made us who we are today. I am a product of my story and our story is one. I was elected in the, 20, in the year 2027 and I was elected by a majority of women who believed in my stories, 
who believed in what I said when I was on radio and who believed in what I said when I went to the villages to bring them together to be one and speak in one voice. When I was elected in Kenya, my community was going through a serious drug addiction menace using the local abuse, substance abuse. We lost our sons and our husbands in thousands. And women had to rise up and speak one language. And some of the women were put in cells like myself, who were taken to jail, some of us, because of speaking against the illegal, illicit brewers of the alcohol that was killing our children. At that time, the president, the former president, Uhuru Kenyatta, rescued me from prison and gave me the power to continue singing and talking the story of women. The women believed in me and gave me the opportunity to become their women representative for Kiambu County. And I garnered the highest number of votes ever, <coughs> ever have been given to any person in Kenya of almost a million votes for a member of parliament. I actually got more votes than the president in my country. <laughs> <laughs> I should have become a president. <laughs> that is the power of people speaking the one story, speaking one language. From then on, I have been at the forefront campaigning against domestic violence. Because every time there is economic pressure, every time there is economic hardship and limitations, there are always results to conflict. And one of the conflicts is domestic conflict. And therefore, I have been the voice against domestic violence. I've rescued quite many women. When I was elected as a member of parliament, I came up with a safe home where I could rescue women suffering from violence. And I went on campaigning against illicit brew and illicit alcohol and substance abuse. I actually started the first rehabilitation center in the country to be run by government. And that rehabilitation center was able to rescue so many young people who are now responsible men back into the society. I am struggling with the reintegration of the same. I believe sisterhood is powerful sharing from the suffrage, the suffrage uh, spirit of uh, the, the predis our predecessors who fought for the right to vote, right to be employed, right to work, and right to be free in, uh, in, in, uh, and also get uh, an equitable income. And therefore, I believe that that one strong story we have, that common story and narrative that we have, we can use it so strongly to propel our own into the political arena so that they can be able to bring legislations and policies that are going to cover and would fill up the gaps. I believe that if the story is continuously one, we have what I call the power of, collection of collective action. When people are speaking the same language, propelling the same message, it is very impossible to be able to have your own people in the platforms where legislation can be, can be made. When I was elected in 2017, I was able to go into the National Assembly and propose laws and policies that have helped to curb what I call the cyberbullying menace, a problem that was hindering so many women from getting into the political space in Kenya. And because I came from the media background and I knew how women kept off politics in Kenya because of cyberbullying, I went into parliament and my first piece of legislation was how to make laws to protect women from cyberbullying. I believe that collective voices can propel women, can propel members of parliament, members of the Senate who can go into those houses and use the platforms they have to cure the problems, to provide solutions for the problems that are limiting women, and more specifically, the affirmative groups to accessing economic and political uh, opportunities. I believe that it is time for us to shift the paradigm. It is time for us to propel the voices of those that have no voices. For those who have voices, it is our opportunity to take up their voices and propel and project to the world like what I have seen in that clip. As I sit here, I am that one woman who dreams to become a president. 
but how do I become a president without having an opportunity to propel the voices of people who believe in me? And that is why I'm here, because I would want to re, uh, request the people in the room to take the opportunity of, of taking over voices of people who have no voice and use them so that they can be heard and they can be considered. I believe my coming here, though this is not my first time to come here, I will be able to get people who can be able to take over my voice and put it to the next level by providing solutions and interventions that can help those people that I do represent. What do I mean? I come from a constituency where we are the leading constituency in Africa in milk production. It is called Gidongori constituency. We have a co the biggest cooperative of milk producers in Africa. We are leading when it comes to the economic basket of milk production in Africa. It is called Fresha, F-R-E-S-H-A. If you Google, you can find it. Fresha's strength is women. Women who do not own cows. The cows are owned by men, but the women are the domestic workers. They are the ones who feed the cows, milk the cows, but when the milk is taken to the dairy for money, the money is paid to the men. I am struggling and working very hard to coming up with policies to make sure that even the women own the cows. But I can't do it forcefully as a politician because I'm afraid I may lose my votes. So I have to use civil societies to come in, provide uh, economic, financial literacy, education, provide advocacy so that we can have the paradigm shift slowly from cow ownership from the men to the cow ownership to the women. We have to craft these languages of advocacy. We have to know how to package so that we get the results and we also do not uh, create disharmony in the society. Mm -hmm. So I'm excited because I have donors who have come in and have provided a solution. And they have come with a policy of donating cows to the women so that even as they milk the cows that belong to the men, they also have a cow that belongs to the woman. Clap for me. <laughs> and so I would be glad to see the cooperative society growing even bigger and larger, but not only earning money that are going that is going to the men's pocket, but money that is also going to the women's pocket. Because if you empower the woman, you have empowered the whole household. If you empower the man, you have empowered his stomach and his <laughs> friends and his, his, his kids. I, I apologize for the men in the house, but that's the, the African setting. Um, as I conclude, other than just empowering the, the women to own house, I empower the women to make sure that they are able to feed their, 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 their families. And we have realized that uh, feeding in a setup where I come from only happens once a day. So children eat only once a day. They either eat breakfast or they eat dinner. So we realize that our children's academic performance is so poor because they cannot concentrate in class when they are hungry. So when I was elected as my second term member of parliament, I have come up with a project to feed the children in school. So I have come up with one central kitchen in my constituency, and that one central kitchen is feeding 22,000 learners. And each learner is paying um, a quarter of a dollar, I think a quarter, quarter is 25, yes, a quarter of, no, uh, an eighth of a dollar. Oh. Every household is paying an eighth of a dollar so that the children can have a hot meal because my constituency, we come from a very cold constituency and ever raining. Mm -hmm. So food needs to be warm for children to eat and absorb quickly and get to understand what's going on in school. So I am here because 
I want to be the flag bearer of the best managed kitchen in Kenya. And currently I've already been voted to have the best kitchen constructed in Kenya. <laughs> I am here because I want to make sure that my 22,000 children feed for every school day. And not only feed, they also take a glass of milk that is milked by their mothers who are already milking the woman's cow. Because the woman's cow milk will not be sold in the dairy. The woman's milk cow will be sold in the village and the women will sell to each other and make some little money. So I am here because I believe 22,000 children will one day become members of parliament like myself. <laughs> will become One day they'll become lawyers like yourself here in the room and, and great people because they fed well, their brain developed well when they are young because I fed them as a leader. I'm not only feeding them and fundraising for them, but I'm also struggling to come up with a legislation in the National Assembly of Kenya so that the government can adopt a school feeding program as a national policy and come up with a five-year strategy to fundraise for feeding, not only my constituency, but the whole of the Republic of Kenya. And when I achieve that, I will certainly become the president of Kenya. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much for your powerful remarks and really the practical examples of how both as an individual and an institutional leader, you are creating impact on Thank the ground. You. Thank you, really. Um, our, our next speaker is Ms. Christian Hughes, uh, who is the president of the National Organization for Women, which is the largest organization of feminist grassroots activists in the United States. As the second African-American president of, in the organization's history, the youngest person of color, Ms. Hughes is, the leading, is leading the organization through an intersectional lens, bringing a diverse coalition of grassroots activists to work against structural sexism and racism. Ms. Nunes has launched key initiatives in support of women's rights, which demand humane treatment of detained immigrant families, in particular women and girls seeking refuge from sexual violence, assault, and poverty. She led the coalition of a Bill of Rights for Immigrant Women and Girls, which has been signed by thousands of supporters and co-sponsors. Thank you so much for joining us today on this panel. Please. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, it is a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this wonderful panel and really talk about the story. Uh, our story is one, it's such a powerful, important and necessary conversation. Um, I'm grateful to be a part of it. As you mentioned, National Organization for Women is the largest grassroots organization and our whole entire history was founded on the principle of grassroots advocacy. So I feel like this is an area that I'm really comfortable speaking toward when we talk about the importance of collective power and community engagement. And more importantly, I think when we talk about our role and our duty, we have to really more start focusing on that more than anything. Because how do we truly make effective change if we're not centering the voices and the stories of the people that are directly impacted? So this is where I want to speak to us today. And then I want to share just a couple examples of how we have done this and how history has shown us consistently that we have done this effectively. And if we continue to follow our history leads, we will continue to be able to make social justice and transform it more effectively. But we also still have to be disruptors when we see oppression and when we see discrimination and we see those things that are occurring. Um, and I mean disruptors when we count it and we tell the truth and we say this cannot occur. So. Um, I like use the word disruptor because I think it's important. <laughs> uh, a lot of times people don't like to use the word, but it means something. It means that we're not allowing something that is not right to continue on. So I just want to kind of start off by talking a little bit about the fact that according to the Southern Poverty Law Center, pay groups in the United States have surged to over 1,000 in recent years. And they're fueled by divisive rhetoric and ideologies of supremacy. They're fueled by misogyny. They're fueled by patriarchy things that are encouraging this division and the hate and separation of different groups. And what we're seeing in the face of such challenges, individual and community engagement emerges as a vigorous force for change. It is needed, it's important. History has repeatedly shown us that if we use the transformative impacts of grassroots movements from the civil rights movement to the, anti, the global anti-apartheid struggle, these movements have fueled individuals and collective movement and a momentum for determination 
that have had, you know, they've catalyzed things like police reform, changed and challenged oppressive systems, and shift societal norms. So we find ourselves at a really interesting place right now in 2024. We're seeing our rights rolled back. We're seeing that device division within our communities. We're seeing racial tension. We're seeing women feeling like their lives and their bodies are not theirs any longer. And so we had a position where it's really important that we once again find a way to start centering the places of marginalized communities and those directly impacted. And more importantly, we have to make sure that we are looking to them as the experts of their own stories and their narratives. That is the most important part. When we are looking to be policymakers, we're looking to organizations, we are not the experts. Can we all say that we are not the experts? <laughs> I want to still say that we are not yeah, the experts yes. because sometimes I think that's when the position gets shifted. We start thinking that we know best for people who are directly impacted and live in, live in experience. And that is not the case. So part of really being transformative and really creating tr inclusion and creating trust to be able to mobilize change is making sure that we are centering individuals and communities and we're giving them the power and we're letting them be the curators of their stories. And we're listening to them to tell us what they need in order to make policy that's effective, that's transformational, not the other way around. So I wanna say that, and then that's how we start eliminating injustices. And that's how we start really building effective coalitions. That's how we empower communities. And that's how we move to places where we start seeing different changes. And statistics have actually shown that when we empower and center communities, there's been a 25% increase in actually in community engagement and that community even building trust within themselves. So let's look at some examples of how this is actually worked. We go back, as we said, when National Organization for Women started around um, segregated job classified classified ads, when men classified ads were one and women classified ads were another. So the Equal Pay Act of 1963 was a big thing for us where the United States uh, really was a big part of women's rights movement and it aimed to eliminate disparities and wage disparities based on gender requirements for equal pay for work. Now, although we are not there yet, we still find ourselves fighting for equal pay. We still see gender wage gap happening and, and, it, and it being increased depending on your, um, if you are a black or brown or indigenous person. But we do know because of the work of the women's movement getting together and coming together and lobbying and saying that we will no longer accept that this equal pay and we deserve to be held accountable and we deserve to be held with respect and have equal wages in the workforce, policies shifted. They, they, they lobbied the legislators, they held, they rallied, you know, they formed grassroots measures, they put public pressure um, that led to legislative change, which eventually led to Equal Pay Act of 1963. This is how they came together to move and mobilize and galvanize, saying we will no longer accept this. It was not one person that did this. It was a, a, core, or a, a group of people who came together to do this work. More importantly, civil rights, movement and the march in Washington. How many of you have heard of March in Washington? Mm -hmm. Such a major, I think many people were involved and during that time, 250,000 actually mobilized together for the March in Washington to, to fight against racism and the fight against, you know, um, oppression, discrimination and the fight for the right to vote. And because they came together and were determined that they know that they had value so they were no longer gonna allow someone to tell them what they had or did not have. They came together and fought for civil and economic rights. They fought for those rights for black Americans. And they also helped that shape the public opinion. They put pressure on lawmakers to uh, enact civil rights legislation. And this is also, we hear of the famous Martin Luther King Jr.'s I Have a Dream speech, which we have one individual that also stuck out, who really was the leader in this moment. So this is another example of how the power of the people um, highlight the power of grassroots organizing, collective action, and affecting social change, mobilizing diverse coalitions. Multiple groups came together to really affect this change. It was not done by one person. Um, another one I want to point out is the Me Too movement we hear a lot about, right? This is a new movement that's been based off of a sexual assault movement that came out. And that was driven in 2017. Um, after, it really, I want to 
I would be remiss if I don't say it was actually started by Toronto. <laughs> and so sometimes it, it, we get confused about who actually started this movement. Um, but the background is, is that it was started by the experience of sexual harassment and assault using the hashtag me too in social media. And it actually started before 2017, but it really took off when the Lessa Milano actress and act the social activist really helped with the hashtag Me Too movement. Um, and this community-led effort was done by global conversations. Women started posting online, Me Too, Me Too, and steering their, their sexual assault experiences and their sexual harassment experiences. What this does would create a sense of normalcy. It helped take away some of the stigma and the shame that was attached with sexual assault. And it took away the silence that so many women often felt. And that created a global movement and conversation about sexual harassment, assault, abuse across various industries that were occurring. And, and they had to start reevaluating it. They were sharing their stories. It was the first time there was like a global social media network for people. Um, and this also helped move policy changes in various sectors, including Hollywood, politics, workplaces. It helped um, readdress free authorization of vow and include different parts with that as well. So this movement was another example of how collectively bringing people together, you can challenge and amplify the voices and create empowerment, but also challenge societal norms, what we accept and what we turn our eyes to. So this empowers survivors and it held accountability and justice for those prosecuting and for those who investigate. Another one I would like to share is the anti-apartheid movement and then I'm going to uh, yield the rest of my time. Uh -huh. uh, and while my mouth showed two more because I think it's really important for now, one not the last one, but the anti-apartheid movement is a huge movement. I think we all are very familiar with as well. And the divest in uh, the, uh, the uh, divestment campaigns that went with that. So the anti-apartheid movement was huge because a big part of that movement was that people were fighting against um, anti-apartheid that was occurring in South Africa between 1948 until the early 1900s. And in order to fight against that, people mobilized in their communities and universities, but they also decided to, you know, divest like to. Um, this stop supporting South Africa and, and businesses that were contributing to South Africa. It put economic pressure, okay? It also said that we will not continually, we will isolate, we will not continue to put and encourage uh, any type of, um, any community that's having oppressive regimes and, that, and they will continue to advocate for human rights. So this is done in multiple ways. They did an investment campaign. They also mobilized like every other part. They gathered together. They worked in sol international solidarity. Um, and through this constant pressure and individual organizations around the world helped, they eventually were able to bring an end to apartheid. It was a very strong campaign that lasted quite a while, but it was just something that happened and, and went past just South Africa. It became a global movement. Um, and so this kind of shows when you can start somewhere and how you continually need to work to use different measures, you can really make some effective change. And the last one I want to talk about, because as a woman, um, the Equal Rights Amendment is something that women have been fighting for for over 100 years um, to be enshrined into the U.S. Constitution. And yet we are still fighting for that right now. But this movement has been going on for quite a while, and it has been completely driven by women who are determined to make sure that we are given our full rights into the Constitution um, and doing everything. And that has been truly driven by a grassroots movement, from getting out and demanding and taking over Senate meetings and petitions and calling legislators and holding rallies and getting together and encouraging legislators and working with them this movement has been going on for 100 years and it continues to go strong until the Equal Rights Men will be enshrined to the Constitution. So even though some of these things haven't fully went into place, the movements are strong. And I think I really liked um, one of the things I heard in the video when they talked about the importance of adjusting strong to the belief in the system. And it reminded me of a quote from Ella Baker um, when she says, we who believe in freedom cannot resist until it comes. And so that's what I think we have to think about when we think about collective policy mm -hmm. and strategy and trying to transform change. And the other one is from Audre Lorde and it's about solidarity. And she says, I am not free if my sister is not free, even if her shackles are very different from my own. 
And so I encourage people to really think about that because it doesn't matter if we understand struggle. It doesn't matter if we understand the movement. It matters that we stand in solidarity because if that person is telling us that they are oppressed, if we believe in justice, if we believe in equality and healing, then it is our job to stand in solidarity and support them in that justice to get that healing and dismantle the work that And I thank you. Thank you so much, Christian, for, for your remarks and really expanding on this theme of collective action and the impact it can have with, with really clear examples. Thank you so much. Um, I did say we have amazing speakers, so I'm glad to, glad you see it for yourselves. Um, our next speaker, uh, which we have the honor to have here, and really, I think she really needs no inter introduction, is Dr. Azakharoff. Uh, Dr. Karam is the CEO of Lead Integrity, a consultancy focusing on leveraging the leadership of women professionals inspired by their faiths for the common good. She's a member of the UN uh, Secretary General's High Level Advisory Board on Effective Multilateralism. She's deeply involved in interfaith and international development, serving on the boards of International Alert, the Temple of Understanding, the Parliament of World Religions, and the Royal Institute for Interfaith Studies. Dr. Karam served as president and CEO, uh, sorry, served as Secretary General of the Women's um, uh, World Conference of Religions for Peace and has worked at the United Nations for over two decades. Uh, she has significantly contributed to the dialogue between religion and development, uh, funding the UN's Multi-Faith Advisory Council and coordinating strategic learning on religion, development, and diplomacy. Thank you so much for <laughs> joining us today. Thank you so much, um, Simon, and thank you for the opportunity to my, for my colleagues in the Baha'i International Community, whom I consider family. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you here today, to listen to Honorable Wabo Chumba and to listen to Ms. Christine Nunes, and honestly, to learn quite a bit. Um, I cannot say enough that there's a tremendous sense of support for everything we've heard from our distinguished speakers. And I'm also here to share a certain sense of concern because not only because of what's going on around us, which heaven knows is interesting enough, um, but I think it's also because we, we speak a great deal and we, we are now on the perimeters and, um, and in the halls of the United Nations space um, as women, and yet, perhaps, perhaps a question to ask is to what extent are our own organizations, whether intentionally or unintentionally, deliberately or by force of circumstance, perhaps repeating some of the same exclusionary tactics that we have long fought against as women, feminists, human rights actors, etc. There is, I think, in the 20th century, in addition to the stories of success that we've heard from Ms. Christine Nunes and from Honorable Wamuchumba, there are also many stories, one of them going on, actually a few of them going on right now, whether it's in Gaza, whether it is in the context of Ukraine, where there are women under attack, and severely so, and there are way too many women dying on a daily basis because of completely avoidable reasons. Some of them are reasons related to health. Many of them are reasons related to the humanitarian uh, um, environmental crisis we find ourselves in because we've created it, um, but also reasons of conflict. We assumed that the creation of the premier multilateral space like the United Nations was built to stop us from any further wars, and yet look at us today. Now, we can most certainly hold our governments accountable, and many of us do, and we continue to lobby and advocate with our governments. But the truth is that nobody's holding civil society accountable. And it is high time that we begin to look indeed at celebrating the achievements and the accomplishments, but also perhaps having a moment of pause to see where our own institutions, human rights oriented institutions, humanitarian oriented institutions, peace oriented institutions may not be doing the stellar job that they are perfectly uh, able to do and absolutely called upon to do. What am I specifically referring to? The reason, and I'm so grateful that you mentioned the example of the anti-apartheid struggle, because this is exactly the model 
that many of us aspire to because we saw it working. We saw uh, a, a regime built on egregious inequality collapse. We saw that those activists who had struggled so hard against it came into positions of authority. And today they are the government, the one government that decided to take another government to the International Court of Justice because they're concerned about what is going on. Clearly, the story of the anti-apartheid struggle is not over. The story of the anti-apartheid struggle is our story today. And I think it's extremely important to link the dots between the different narratives rather than what we've seen happening from the 20th century till today, which is this practice of cherry picking certain human rights. It's the right to education. It's the right to a safe environment. It's the right to try to have peace. It's the right to have freedom of religion and belief. It's the, and they are each incredibly important rights that need to be fought for and struggled for. But they are not individual rights that can exist in isolation from every other right. We forgot, it seems, that there is an interdependence between every single aspect of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. We cannot be free to practice our faith or belief if we are at the same time not allowed to be able to say our own opinions. We are not allowed to come together to, to struggle together. And absolutely not if we're not allowed to hold accountable ourselves and our governments. So there is an interdependence of all of these different rights. And yet look at the plethora of NGOs alone. I'm not talking about governments now. Let's just look at civil society. The plethora of non-governmental organizations in one country, in any one country, that are doing exactly the same thing, that are all fighting, and it's one right, that are all so busy fighting about either the right of one constituency or the rights around a particular issue, but rarely ever do we see a solidarity across the civil society in one nation that is actually targeting the whole of the human rights agenda because one, even the success in only one space by no means guarantees the success in the rest of the human rights spaces. We are at a moment of inflection in our historical analysis where I think if we don't pause ourselves to take some responsibility for what we are each doing that is incredibly important and absolutely necessary and yet where we may not be connecting the solidarity dots between and amongst ourselves, not only in any one nation, but across, which was the story and one of the many lessons of the anti-apartheid struggle. It wasn't in one country. It was not a solidarity movement that was built on any one country. It was not even just the one region. It was a global solidarity movement, which was significantly assisted and involved and engaged with other solidarity struggles. There is a legacy in the Middle East where I come from, where whether it was Lebanon or Palestine or Syria or many other countries, the anti-apartheid struggle was considered our own. And I think this is something that we miss right now is that the other's struggle is our own, to own it. By all means, celebrate what we can do. We have to do that. In fact, we have to improve upon how we celebrate, by the way, because we're so busy saying what's, what's problematic. And we must be even more busy to celebrate. But in the celebration, we need that moment of humility to understand that we are not connecting the dots. Our story is one. Our struggle needs to be one, two, which means we cannot cherry pick which struggles to be part of and which to be silent about, because it might be a bit of a problem to speak out. If there is one thing that has characterized women's movements anywhere in the world, anywhere in the world, it is that we consistently insist on standing shoulder to shoulder with one another. It is supposed to be a struggle different from any other because women are women anywhere they are. And because we have been facing multiple layers of oppression and subjugation. So, and yet look at us, many of us today, where we seem to be doing the same thing that our male colleagues have done over many centuries, which is to cherry pick the specific issue that they wish to mobilize against and be advocates for. We must indeed be specialists on specific issues that are of particular concern, but we will not succeed until we are generalists when we stand in solidarity. We have to be specialists in our knowledge by all means, but we must be generalists in solidarity.
And this is where I think we may perhaps not be connecting the dots. We, why we have a situation today, not only where we are still talking about unacceptable degrees of deaths of men and women and children everywhere in the world, but we are also talking about rampant poverty. We're talking about the inaccessibility to basic preventive care for so many millions of people in so many parts of the world. We're talking about hunger as a norm when there is overflow and excess in parts of the world. Surely, surely we are talking about more of the same rather than having actually changed the course of history and the way that we see one another. And how can we not take a pause to realize that the very planet we live on in itself is subordinated and exploited beyond belief. How can we think that we will get successes in our respective areas of concern when the very earth we stand on suffers and may not allow us the oxygen that we need or the water that we cannot live without? So there is a moment, I think, and if it's not going to be up to the women's rights movement, which should be the quintessential human rights movement, but there is a moment in which we have to understand that even our human rights sisters and brothers may have been carried away a little bit by the respective human rights that they're focusing on, even when it is women's rights, because there is no such thing as women's rights in excess of, or in difference to or apart from the rights of the rest of humanity and now the rights of this planet. We are responsible for the health of this particular planet because it's all we've got. And without it, all of us suffer. That should have been lesson number one from the COVID experience. COVID wasn't distinguishing between people based on where they are. But when we came to treat it, we did distinguish between who had access to the cure. And I think we have a moment right now, which is if we are to, to believe in the fundamental tenet of our story is one, then I would like to hear all of us, whether we happen to be Baha'is or Muslims or Christians or Hindus or Buddhists or with no faith, actually speak to one another's concerns and actually stand alongside one another. One of the lessons that was most painful for me when I served all the world's religions was to realize the extent to which even our own religious institutions, our faith communities, tend to be rather tribal in their sense of affiliation with one another. I assume that if you believe in a greater power, you stand alongside one another because that greater power is in the other, just as it is in you. But I realized and I learned that our institutions, every single institution we have today is in a state of crisis. Whether it happens to be a small NGO in a country or whether it happens to be a parliament or a political party, heaven knows whether it happens to be the UN system itself or its many equivalents. The problem that we have today is that we stand in solidarity alone. We stand in solidarity on specific issues. And we forget that if we are to have one story, because it is one story, then I'd like to hear us all speak out against the oppression of our fellow sisters, brothers, kids everywhere in the world. We need to ask ourselves why we still don't do that. Thank you. Wow, oh, thank you for your beautiful remarks. Really, I, I was waiting for it to keep going. <laughs> it was so good. No, no, to keep going. It's so good. Thank you, really. And uh, and for, for making these points about really understanding and sharing uh, each other's struggles and standing shoulder to shoulder uh, uh, in, in practice. Thank you very much. Um, so last but certainly not least, we have um, our next speaker who is virtual, uh, joining us virtually, uh, uh, Ms. Christina Ariaga. I'm just going to wait for her to, there she is. Uh, Christina Ariaga, she's a trustee of Meta's Oversight Board, which is an independent entity created to help Meta deal with difficult content decisions. Uh, for more than three decades, uh, Ms. Ariaga has worked on defending freedom of expression as well as religious freedom as a member of the U.S. delegation to the U.N. Human Rights Commission, the U.S. Civil Rights Commission, the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, and an executive director of a Washington, D.C.-based public interest law firm that de defends the free expression of all religious traditions. 
Um, Ms. Ariaga is a recipient of the Museum's Free Expression Award and a sought after speaker on the intersection of freedom of speech and religious freedom. And she will speak to us really about the, um, the interconnection of social movements and social change with the, the rise of social media uh, in recent decades. Please, Christine, go ahead. Um, thank you so much. Um, Asa Karam uh, is always a tough act to follow. So now I'm mad that I did not try to go in before her. Um, and actually all the speakers, it's, it's a great honor to have listened to all of you and what a terrific panel you've put together, um, Sim, and I, I'm really grateful to you. So our story is one. Our story is one is exactly what Bartolomé de las Casas told himself in 1545 when he, while in Cuba, realized that the slaves uh, and the non-slaves, the owners, were the same. Their story was one. He realized then and told others that Christ had died for slaves and not slaves alike, and that slavery was in fact a sin, and thus started the idea behind human rights that we're all born with human dignity, regardless of the color of our skin, regardless of our gender, regardless in which, con which country we have been born. Um, our stories won. That's what the Quakers said in 1600, before the founding of the United States, um, when they forbade any Quaker member to, again, own slaves. They started the abolitionist movement. They started the Underground Railroad movement. And that's because they understood their story was one. Our story is one, is what happened in 1948 before the drafting of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, where people saw the Holocaust as something so horrid that it could not happen to any other human being in the world or in Europe. And that gave way to a change of culture, a change in laws, a change in the idea of sovereign countries. Our story is one. And our story is one is so powerful that it changed laws all over the, the world. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights was drafted in 1948. The European Convention came soon after the European Court of Human Rights, the largest human rights adjudicator in the world, which has enormous normative influence in laws, not only in Europe, in not only in those 47 countries that are members of those 800 million people, but all over the world. And a culture change because our laws change and our laws change because of our culture change. And as has been said so beautifully by previous speakers, there is such a power in understanding that our rights are interdependent and they're indivisible and they're also universal. Now, we have to focus on what's going to happen with our story as one with the advent of social media platforms. Uh, and this is something that presents, in my view, an enormous challenge, but also an incredible opportunity for us in the human rights world. And a small disclaimer, I'm speaking here. I'm, I am a trustee for the Oversight Board, but um, my remarks are my, my own personal views on, on this. So as you know, meta products are used by half of the world's adult population, WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook. Uh, the amount of volume that meta uh, has to handle in terms of content moderation is practically unimaginable. And I doubt when Mark Zuckerberg was sitting in his dorm room <laughs> creating Facebook, he would imagine that Facebook would be this engineering product that he was created would be at the intersection of very difficult human rights issues and freedom of expression issues that Facebook would be used by bad actors to incite hatred and violence against other people. So Mark Zuckerberg created in 2018, the oversight board, and that's what I sit on. And the oversight board is an independent entity devoted to listening to appeals and finding ways to help Facebook change their moderation rules so that content can be better uh, handled. 
the so far the oversight board has received over two million appeals and it can only hear a handful of cases every year because there are only 23 adjudicators so what they do they adjudicators the judges people by the way from all over the world uh, you have the former prime minister of denmark you have the first arab woman to win, to win a nobel prize you have um people from the global south you have people from the global north and they get together, they look at these cases and they try to take cases that are emblematic and that set precedent for freedom of expression and for the idea of it being able to persuade social media platforms to do the right thing. And I wanted to tell you about one of the cases that was handled last year in July of 2022. And that is the case where a Facebook user posted in a group that described itself as supportive freedom from Iran the frame um, in Farsi posted Mark Bar Khomeini. Uh, as for those of you who speak Farsi, you understand that that can mean a number of things, including death to Khomeini. So Facebook moderators decided that that went against their community rules and they removed the post. But the person who posted this appealed to the oversight board. The oversight board was able to overturn Facebook's decision and was able to tell Facebook that these were not literal words trying to um, incite violence against a person. They were words that were meant to get a movement started and raise awareness and Facebook changed its rules. Um, so I'll tell you a little bit about the good news, then we can talk about the challenge, and then we can end on a, on a good note again. Um, so in, in 2018 and 2020, Pew in, uh, conducted a number of surveys in the United States. And overall, eight in 10 Americans say social media platforms are very or somewhat effective in raising public awareness about political social issues. And you've seen this beautifully with precisely what we're talking about today. The Baha'i international community was extremely successful in raising awareness in the world. Uh, another opportunity is Facebook is now the largest country in the world. Mm -hmm. The same way that uh, the idea that human dignity was not, um, in, was not limited by geographical boundaries that was initially contemplated in 1948 has now become a reality because of social media platforms. We can communicate with each other. Uh, also, another great thing about social media platforms, and that is that in minorities and individuals in countries where communication has not been as easy as it has been in other countries are able to communicate with each other with the use of social media platforms. Here's a challenge. We tend to depersonalize ourselves in when we are engaged in social media platforms. We tend to forget that the people on the other side are human beings just like we are. And unfortunately, social media platforms have been used to dehumanize people. So, Back to our story is one. I like to emphasize not only the one, but the story. And us in the communication business like to talk about the PhD formula, personalize, humanize, and dramatize. I would urge our NGO communities and our states as well to do the following three things. One is there is a dearth of people in the human rights field that are involved in technology. And the same way that when we go to a non-NGO or non-human rights community, we understand that they may not understand our vocabulary and we have to introduce them to the topic. I think that we also need to do the reserve. We need to have people who are trained in human rights parlance and understand the ethical and moral implications of what is going on with social media platforms and with artificial intelligence. And we have to infiltrate technology and, and, and make sure that there's 
awareness, but we have to do it from an educated perspective. We have to train ourselves to do that. We have to encourage young men and women to enter into this field of technology. Um, second, we need to help each other out with our hashtags and with our campaigns. Uh, it is true that NGOs, where we tend to be really busy people, uh, and we also have the tendency to uh, sometimes operate in our echo chamber. And I think it is important, as Azakaram so brightly said, to ensure that we're connecting the dots, that we're generalist when it comes to activism, but also social media platform activism. And finally, I like to end on, on uh, uh, I was gonna say a good note, but uh, essentially uh, with, the, with the, a powerful story. Um, in 2020, a black Cuban activist, Dennis Solis um, was arrested for exercising his freedom of expression and his freedom of religion or belief. And he filmed and posted that the police arresting him on Facebook. That started a movement in Cuba that has that is still going on. It hasn't been successful yet. That's why it's not a good story yet. But it awakened a lot of people to what was going on. Why were they awakened to it? Well, it's a very small island um, relative to the rest of the world. But the government had been very successful in cutting off access to Wi-Fi and access to social media platforms, neighborhood by neighborhood. So neighbors did not know each other. Neighbors had not been able to understand that there, that there were some neighbors fighting for human rights. And Dennis Soli started a movement that I'm hoping one day will bring to the Cuban people uh, the first free elections in, in over six decades, that they will bring to the Cuban people the idea that they each have a voice and that the world has not forgotten them. Uh, I, again, thank you very much for having me on this panel. Uh, I am very grateful to the Baha'i international community and our story is indeed one. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina, uh, for your really um, wonderful remarks and really shedding light on, on the role of uh, media very clearly for us in, in social movements and people movements. Um, so we've had this great uh, panel of speakers and we have about 20 minutes now for question and answer or comments uh, from the audience because really we want this to also be a conversation with you all uh, after hearing of from all the panelists uh, about this topic from different uh, different sides. So the floor is open essentially for, for any questions or comments. Please. Thank you so much for this really powerful panel. Um, my name is Laura Edidin. I'm the Senior Vice President of Programs and Partnerships for Women Creating Change which is a New York City-based nonprofit that for almost 110 years has amplified the voices of women in civil life. Uh, today, we center the experiences of women who are facing barriers to civic engagement, women of color, low-income women, uh, members of the LGBTQ community. And we do that by providing training, education, um, uh, organizing and connecting in policy and advocacy and through research. And I have to say that the our story is one resonated so deeply with me today because in listening to what all of you said, I heard things that we in New York are struggling with and that uh, we as an organization have been taking on. Um, from the Honorable Wilma Chumba, when I heard you talking about violence, threatened and actual, directed at women who raise their voices in political life. That's something that's very real uh, here in the US and it is a major barrier. Um, Ms. Nunez, when I heard you talking about centering the lived experiences of those who are impacted by policies um, and by legislation, um, that is something that um, too often there's 
impact. The, the very people who are being impacted, their stories are divorced completely from the things that are being designed supposedly for their benefit. Um, and Ms. Karam, when I heard you talking about layers of oppression and what we hear from women about the weariness of having to defend when multiple parts of their identity are under attack, uh, that spoke to me. And, um, oh, she's not up there anymore. I turned, turned to look at her. Um, um, she can hear you. Though. Okay, good. <laughs> so when Ms. Ariaga was um, at the end talked about how there, even as we are so connected, there are neighbors who still don't know what's happening with their neighbors, with whom they could be allies. Um, so there's so many questions I wanna ask, but I don't wanna dominate the conversation. So I guess for me, um, because our role is to increase civic engagement by women, uh, in particular, Honorable Wama Chumpa, I would, I would welcome hearing from you how women who are faced with the kind of uh, threats you described, you said women are not supposed to be in political spaces, right? Uh, they face uh, torture. Uh, they face threats to their economic well-being. Um, how can the collective, which you've harnessed so powerfully, uh, be used to provide some sense of safety for women who want to be involved in political life, but are understandably fearful because of everything you described? Thank you. Yes, please, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, if I hear you right, you are asking what is it that we need to do so that we can uh, reduce the number of cases of women who are politically suppressed um, and even create more women into the political arena or political space. I think what, what we need to do first is to um, create laws and policies that are going to protect the women in the political space um, and give them some comfort, some psychological comfort that it is no longer <clears throat> the exposure that, I, that has been there because this law protects me, for example. In Africa, I think you've heard about the affirmative action laws that we have, um, laws that allow women, for example, when I was campaigning, my Kenyan law provides that I get extra security against my male opponents, and that is the law. And so such kind of laws are, are, are positive because they make women feel a little bit more psychologically protected and they feel like there's a cushion for them. The other thing we need to do is to obviously create a lot of uh, capacity building for women, you know, um, talk to the other, to the other personality of a woman and create, create confidence that you can do it. You have what it takes to become a politician. You can actually survive in the political waters. And I think that's something that you really need to work on because most women from the cultural setting we come from, from the socialization we come from, especially from Africa, the women belongs to the kitchen, the women belong to the laundry rooms, the women belong to, to the bedrooms but they don't belong to the law-making houses. And therefore, that is something that we need to start socializing our children, even when they are, they, are, they are young, along the way, so that they can also feel that they belong to the political arena. The last that we must do, and we must intentionally do, is to empower women economically, because politics without resources is, is, a, is, a, is, is a funny game. Yes, so I mean, for us to survive in politics, you just have to have some resources because you have to campaign three times more than the male counterparts. The, your story, your political story to be credible must be said three times more louder than the male opponent. I survived against 13 male op opponents for my last 2022 campaign. And I can tell you, I think I spent more money than, eight, than the collective all of them. Because you know, every the 13th of the male opponents were all attacking me because I was the only woman in the race. 
And so uh, you can imagine, so I had to spend more resources. I had to spend more time more than any other of my of the of the of the competing candidates so we must intentionally craft programs that are going to support women economically otherwise it's going to be the same same thing and also we have to come up with a formula for retention a retention formula you know every time for example in my country there is election Every civil society is campaigning, oh, we want more women, we want more women. But how do you bring women from outside, yet the ones that are already inside are not getting the right environment for them to prosper? I mean, for them to lead. So the two thirds, for example, in Kenya, we have struggled with the two thirds uh, gender principle uh, rule in Kenya for the last eight years. And the law itself has never passed in the National Assembly for eight years. We have done 13 attempts 13 debates in the National Assembly. And every time we debate about two thirds gender principle, we lose it to the men because our men still believe that space belongs to them. We are invading the space. And so that we have to really do a lot of work to make sure that we retain the few numbers that we have, even as we harness other numbers into the houses. Thank you, I hope I've answered your question. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much, please. Uh, my name is Amira Fadet. I'm uh, from Egypt and I work with a global organization called Musawa that works towards uh, gender equality within Muslim context. And I feel really fortunate to be here today to listen to such an inspiring talk and to you as well. And I think it's going to take me a long time to <laughs> forget what Aza said when she said we stand in solidarity alone. That really resonated with me and Earlier today, I was attending a session that was by the Women Fund Asia, and there was this lady speaking about the Dalit community of like untouchable women in India, and she was saying how these women uh, spend a lifetime working lands on lands that they don't own, <clears throat> and how she tried to get them to you know claim property rights. And to me, it sounded so much like the cows, you know, how they're working, and I feel like. This is exactly what we need. But I also feel like we're so overwhelmed with our own issues that I don't know how to make that bridge. How do we make that step? So as I salute you for you know being brave and saying that. And my question is, how do we even use just even CSW? Like there's fragmentation within it. Like what I heard this morning and what I heard you speak, I'd love for the two of you to talk to each other. I'm sure there's so much learnings that can happen. So maybe it's more theoretical or abstract, but I was personally very moved by this. And I would love to know like, if you have particular tips or ideas or suggestions of how maybe on an individual level or even as a group of people coming to CSW and flying from all over the world to you know, make our story as one a reality. And I thank the Baha'i community for actually bringing us together and speaking about this. <laughs> I think I think it's a, it's exactly at the heart. The question is the the heart of where we're struggling. But I think if you look at the context of the CSW, for instance, and you see how how many of us are able to be here at the same time. How many, of course, did not make it here, but we're all here at the same time. These are each opportunities to connect and link up with one another. But I don't think that the challenge necessarily is only up to us as women. I think we, we, we've we been working in our silos for so long and our silos are incredibly overwhelming. There's a heck of a lot to do. What we're hungry for, as the Honorable said, is an opportunity to build capacities, but it's actually, and, and I think this is um, what our colleague who um, chairs uh, the, the, the META, alluded to, it's how do we use the available resources of media and communications in order to transcend what are other sort of boundaries that are there. And I really hate to say it this way, but I think if people who mean harm can unite, mm -hmm. and they do, we need to learn something from some of those tactics, okay? So one of the things that struck me is that we, we, we talk about women's rights and many, many rights and the inter sectional nature of rights. Um, 
And yet, and we keep saying legitimately that religion and culture are still impediments thanks to the way some institutions tend to push things forward. Even though I dare say Musawa's work is an excellent example of how some of this can be very, very successfully overcome, the cultural and religious elements. But just to, let's just take that for a second, that thought for a second. The truth is that we're still, as women's rights organizations, we're actually not necessarily working in systematic collaboration with the rest of the human rights organizations and entities, because we've managed to find a silo between the rest of the human rights organizations and women's rights organizations. So that it seems as if they're two separate domains when in fact, how can you possibly realize a human rights agenda without women's rights or vice versa? But I would start with identifying human rights organizations and actors who, who are not listening to some of this very critical lessons learned and making sure that they are part of that journey of activism and engagement. I would also look at the successes of the very, very ultra conservative religious movements who are scoring significant successes and taking away and detracting from very hard won rights for women. Yes, of course, we can marginalize and say, well, we don't really need to focus too much on them because we have a, but yeah, but we're not working very well together. The faith inspired women's rights movements are often not working with the secular women's rights movements. It's as if you have those who want to work on and with a Christian orientation working together on women's rights, those who are working on Muslim issues, working together on women's rights, if they're for lucky, those who are working on Jewish issues, working together on human rights, and then there's the rest of the secular women's rights movement. So I would say, um, physician, heal thyself. We look internally to where we ourselves, whether we're faith-inspired or secular, are actually aiming towards the same things, but we are not necessarily making those bridges of connection and connectivity. That's why we set up um, the integrity. It's meant to be all those who are faith inspired, doesn't matter what the faith is, but are all working in different domains in life. So they can be scientists, they can be managers of, they can be educational folks, they can be anything. They're inspired by their faith for sure, but they're working in so many different areas of life because at the end, it's not so much what your religion necessarily said or what your faith dictates, but the service that you are performing to the whole of society at the same time. We need to build bridges between the secular and faith-inspired women's rights. We need to build bridges between religious, different religiously-inspired women's rights organizations. And we need to start actively targeting, you're absolutely right, honorable, that it's about building capacities. But perhaps what we need to do is focus on building the men's capacities. Because so far, we are talking about men who still are becoming even more misogynistic in their tactics of exclusion. And we're talking about something else that we're not allowed to talk about because it's a big taboo, which is other women who stand in opposition to women. And we never go there because it's such a problem. But the truth is that too is a challenge. And very often it's not automatic. And this country has lived it multiple times. It's not automatic that women will vote for women. It's absolutely not automatic. In fact, what is seems to be the case is that women can stand in direct opposition to other women. So we need to revisit our tactics of exclusion, which by the way, every single institution has. No matter what the ultimate aim, every single institution has tactics of exclusion. And if we don't do a little bit of self-reflexivity about what it is that we're doing to exclude others, we will always be excluding others as a matter of principle. Okay, so build the bridges, do some self-reflexivity, and ensure that we can be much more targeted in terms of engaging with those who, whether they are different male leaders or women leaders, who may not be on the same page. If I can say thank you back after this amazing remark she just said. Yeah, but I think I, I just point out what she's saying. I think it's also about accountability and holding those leaders accountable um, because if you're not choosing leaders who have that vision to lead in that way of inclusivity and leading that way of solidarity that is inclusive and understanding intersectionality and the multiple levels of identities and oppression and you're not and they're the ones who are making these decisions we're never going to get there either so i think that's where the accountability comes into place with that ability to move forward is that we have to start looking at our organizations looking at the policies that we have in our organizations and challenging those policies and are they policies and practices 
that are creating exclusion and oppression in itself and our leaders and are they pushing that as well because to going off of the framework that's how we've always done it I hate that line but I hear it all, I hear it all the time right yeah <laughs> but you know and, and start challenging that so that we can actually move into the direction we want to move on because I think that's a big part too is that we have to start feeling that like she's saying that internal reflection of our own civic organizations and societies accountable and seeing what are we doing to either help bridge or block. Thank you so much. Uh, we have room for one more question and then we can maybe go to conclude remarks. Please go ahead. Hi there. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. It was really inspiring and a much needed discussion. And my question is, how do we look at the difference between harmful speech and free speech? Because I think that's where the tension is. What do we consider exclusion and inclusion? Because the harmful speech, we have our eyeballs on social media and it's based on advertising. And advertising means it keeps your eyeballs on social media. And it, we create these silos that advertising takes advantage of us. So how do we differentiate within our spheres of influence and get on social media and help change that because I, I have been going on different right-wing social media platforms and trying to just discuss. And it's really interesting how the harmful backlash comes back. And it's, um, I think we need to start looking at that and talk to the young people because look at the age of us in here. Most of us are older and how do the young people, how do, do they have any idea on how we could change this? Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I, I would love, I, I hear this in a lot, but to me, I think it's a very easy answer. Hate leads to violence. It, you know, it's vitriol. I mean, like when you hear hate speech, it is leading to a path of harm. Yeah. Like the cure, perfect word, it's harmful. Yeah. It's, it's leading to hate, you know, it's leading to violence. It's there to harm. It's there to distract. Free speech is not necessarily doing the same thing, you know. It can if a person is leading to direction, but I think, you know, there's a, there's a fine line to it. But if a person's intention is to harm, their intention is to destruct, their intention is to, to um, you know, put this, this vitriol out, I think that's when we're really looking at hate speech, you know, more than anything. And I think that's a very clear example of it. There is, of course, fine lines that some free speech, but I think when you clearly see that, we know what the intention is. Mm -hmm. And we could usually call that hate speech more than anything. Yeah. Um, we have Christina has her hand up. Please proceed. Um, thank you for your question regarding social media. Um, I just wanted to make two quick points. points. I know we're almost out of time. One is the solution for hate speech is not less speech, it's more speech. And we need to be able to talk about these things. Words change meaning, there are words within context. There's not going to be ever, ever a law or a regulatory system that's going to deal with this. So I think that it's an important question to raise, but given the the atmosphere that we live in right now, I think we're maybe swinging too much in the other direction where people are so concerned. Over 63% of Americans, um, and I can give you data from all over the world, are do no, no longer talk about their political views with each other for fear of offending or for fear of um, backlash. There are all sorts of organizations now that are devoted to the idea that we should be talking a lot more with each other rather than less. How that takes place in social media platforms is a very difficult and complex matter. And I think it's going to be a challenge for our children and our children's children. But I do want to say that more conversations and more, um, more of us to have the ability of seeing in the other person, a person just like us who may have a different view rather than immediately resorting to the idea that what the person is saying is so offensive that it could be hate speech. I mean, we all need to be educated. So I just wanted to finish on that point. Thank you. 
Thank you, Christina. And I think this is exactly what we've been kind of talking about here. The topic of, of today's panel is how to really engage in conversations and also in ways, have those conversations in ways that are actually constructive. So to have more of type of conversations that will change narratives for the better. I think, uh, yeah, Pierre, go ahead. Just very quickly, I want to make a pitch for a particular book that's actually been reprinted because it was done some time ago. It's uh, by David Hawkins. It's called Power Versus Force. Mm -hmm. And it, yeah. And yes, brilliant. And it's interesting because they, they effectively, he starts with kinetic experiments to see how, how certain words can have an impact on the body. So there's actually, there's, there's experiments and it's evidence-based to show how some forms of speech can actually physically harm people. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's I think that that link we often forget when we are so so insistent on free speech, we don't realize that speech can be also physically so effectively. And I think the other point to mention is this: that indeed, I think Christina is absolutely right. We need more speech, but we need better speech. In other words, speech that is more respectful, and that's something that we don't automatically have. And we're living at a time when it's actually a good idea to say something really nasty and mean. Um, and where the, the discourse of civility has been significantly undermined. So we do have an obligation to be speaking more, but speaking more in a way that is ultimately looking at the welfare of the person or the persons or the community that we are trying to communicate with, rather than enhancing our own selves. So, so. Thank you so much. This has been such a rich conversation today. Uh, and we hope that this will be an ongoing conversation between all of you here and also with the with wonderful speakers that we have and, and to really continue this dialogue. I wanted to give just maybe 30 seconds to one minute max to each <laughs> panelist to, to share their concluding remarks with us before before ending. So can you start again? Thank you. Yeah. Good. Okay. <laughs> Um, mine is to thank the Baha'i community for giving us the opportunity to be here, to share with these wonderful people in the room. I do believe that out of our interactions, uh, we have uh, some, some lessons to take home. And uh, looking forward to follow-ups even after this sitting so that we can be able to uh, move to the right towards the right direction. And what I've picked from this meeting is that um, the assumption that um, our collective actions are positive, it's something that we should interrogate further. We should try and connect the dots, like uh, Dr. Dr. Azran Karam has said, and I think that's for me, the take home message. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Saman. Um, I also want to thank Baha International Community for putting together this wonderful panel discussion and you and Julie that brought as well. Um, I, I just feel that overall, I think that the message that struck most with me was just how our solidarity cannot be in silos. Um, and I, and that's something I've always said, and I was so excited to hear uh, Dr. Graham also say it, but I, this, her message as well was so strong um, and just talking about the importance of our communities being consistent. And I think that consistency was also something I think that stuck out for me in the work that we're doing in our organizations um, and the work we're doing uh, for women and that we have to be consistent in that work uh, so that we can truly work toward that healing and that restoration and that transformative change that we're looking for. So I also hope for continued conversation from this. And then this is just um, opening the dialogue discourse and we continue to move toward what we're all hoping for. Thank you. Thank you so much. First of all, I don't just want to thank the Baha'i community. I love the Baha'i community. <laughs> it's mutual. Yeah. Um, I, I also want to say that I think it takes something that I've learned from the Baha'i international community members over many, many years is a certain sense of, of humility and wisdom, that there is humility and wisdom and wisdom and humility. And I just want to say that that's something that we, we all need to carry very close in our hearts and to exemplify with one another. Um, to me, that is the fundamental essence of our story as one. Thank you so much. Christina. 
Sorry. Um, I think the most said words in the last um, two years have been you're on mute. Um, sorry about that, <laughs> it's very annoying. Um, um, I, I too love the Baha'i community. So once again, um, following us Karam's path. Uh, and I, I thought I would, I would re this morning I woke up thinking about Mona and she's the last girl who was martyred. Um, and she, it, and, I'm correct, right, Simon? Yes. She was the last one? Yes, yes. She was the and, last of the 10 women that we spoke about. She was and she's the youngest. And she was the youngest. And she asked to be the last one so she could give the other women courage and pray for them as she watched each one of them hang. I don't know that I would have that courage, but I'm reminded of her when I'm called to stand by one of my fellow human rights um, defenders. And I, I think it's, it's important to, to remember her example. So I thank you for putting this campaign together and reminding us of her great courage. So we ourselves are inspired to imitate what she did for others. Thank you. Thank you so much. And really the love is, is mutual uh, for both of you. And, uh, and thank you for ending on that note, Christina, which is really the 10 women and I think the entire message of this campaign was that the story of these 10 women is the same story as every woman today experiences. And, and this path is one and will continue to be one. So thank you so much for all of you for joining us today and, uh, and to the wonderful panelists and we hope to continue this conversation. Thank you.